Okay, we will get started here on the Mid-Atlantic Logger Training monthly webinar series. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we are excited today to have a, a great presentation and hopefully we'll have some uh, lively discussion about some of the topics that uh, are presented today. Uh, our topic today is how OSHA uh, takes on one of the deadliest industries in the mid-Atlantic. Um, and uh, But before we get into that, we're going to go over a couple housekeeping items. Uh, first of all, thank you for registering. Uh, second of all, this session is being recorded. So uh, if you, uh, uh, it will be recorded for on archived, uh, on-demand viewing for credit later on. Um, additional information um, will be provided at the end of the session, so you can go back and watch some of our original ones if you haven't, if you've missed a couple of these, um, and, uh, and get some additional credits. Um, note that all of your cameras and microphones are off, uh, nobody can see you or hear you, um, and you can't change those settings by yourself. Um, we can, uh, if you want to ask a question later, we should be able to do that for you, though. Um, I'm your host today. Uh, my name is Ben Spong. I'm the Forest Operations Extension Specialist at West Virginia University. Uh, I'm here sort of on behalf of the West Virginia uh, side of, of this project. We also have uh, Agnes uh, from the uh, Maryland Delaware Master Logger Program. We have Karen Snape from the uh, Virginia Tech uh, and, uh, sorry, the uh, Virginia Tech, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Master logger. It's not Sharp, master sharp logger. Sharp logger. Ah, there thank you. Go. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, and then Brad Perkins from the Ohio uh, Forestry Association, and uh, and he's representing the forestry, uh, the loggers uh, programs there um, in Ohio. So uh, we thank everybody for joining us today. Um, some additional housekeeping items um, as we go through the presentation. Um, if you'd like to ask a question. Uh, you can use that question and answer button. Um, you'll notice that on your screen. Um, if you just click on that, it'll open up a little screen and you can type in your question. Um, you can also type in your uh, any other comments or discussion points in the chat box. Um, or you can also raise your hand. And if you raise your hand, um, one of our co-organizers uh, here um, will work to try to uh, uh, get, uh, get to you and allow you to ask a, a normal question. So uh, uh, so that's the rough uh, program here. And uh, note that each one of our sessions here um, are worth one continuing edu education credit, um, or eight if you attended all eight of our sessions. And this is our fourth one now. So we have three, um, uh, we have uh, four more, I guess, um, that will be coming up in, in the next uh, few months. Um, the certificates are going to be submitted to each of the state's logger programs, and um, they will be emailed to you, um, the participant, within one week of the session. So you should get copies of those in your email that you use to, to register for this webinar. Um, note, you shouldn't have to send those to each of your state programs. Uh, we will be submitting those directly on your behalf, and, but you should keep your certificate just in case if there's some sort of communication breakdown. Uh, you will have that documentation that you attended the meeting. Our next three webinars that we're going to have um, in September, uh, we're going to talk about loggers and deer and forest management. October 26th, we'll have logging insurance and risk management, um, talking about some of the different things that you should have, why you should have them, and, uh, and what happens if you don't have those things. Uh, and then November 30th, we'll be talking about truck accidents and other casualty claims and how do we win as the logging professional. Uh, so we hope we'll join you, uh, you'll join us for some of those next uh, coming webinars. Uh, our next one, of course, is that combining deer and forest management. Um, and that will be again at 6.30 to 8 on September 28th. So getting to today's speaker, uh, we have Anthony Milam here. And he is a compliance assistant specialist in our Charleston, West Virginia area OSHA office. He's been there for about three years. Um, he was a compliance officer for four years in the Charleston area office and also has worked for a number of years in the Norfolk area uh, OSHA office. Um, he's conducted approximately 50 logging inspections, um, including those that are programmed, 
complaints and also the fatality investigations. Um, inspecting all sorts of logging jobs, uh, probably covering all the different sizes of our participants that we have here today. Um, so with that, it's my pleasure to, uh, to welcome Anthony to our uh, webinar series. And from now on, uh, Anthony will be uh, have the reins and be able to uh, uh, have control of, of the session here. Make sure to ask any questions uh, in the question and answer box and we'll, hopefully we'll be able to answer those. Uh, and then at the end of the session, we'll have some time to chat and, uh, and answer all those questions um, that may, may not have been able to be answered during the session. Okay, Anthony, uh, I think you can go ahead and start your presentation. Okay, Ben, can you see that again? Yes, I can. All right, very good. Uh, like Ben said, my name is Anthony. I'm the Compliance System Specialist at the Charleston, West Virginia area OSHA office. Uh, I have conducted a fair number of logging inspections. So if you have any questions, uh, just shout them out. Quick disclaimer, uh, this presentation was compiled, made by me, a Compliance System Specialist. It does not substitute for any of your regulatory training requirements uh, that you have, so you still are required to have those training as well. Uh, brief discussion for today. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about our office specifically. Uh, some of you are more than likely within our jurisdictional area. We'll compare and look at some of the West Virginia enforcement statistics with the national enforcement statistics over some commonly found hazards uh, that we run across in logging. Give you the top 10 violations for our office and nationally that you will probably won't be surprised to see that basically identical. Um, same top 10 for both. Take you through the ocean inspection process because I'm sure the majority of you probably have never been inspected by ocean before. Give you a couple of resources to help you out in case you are ever inspected by ocean to help prevent you getting citations. And of course, if you have any questions, uh, shout them out when you have it. But basically, the way OSHA tries to reach employers, not just logging employers, but any employer in any industry, first is outreach. Uh, that is events like this, presentations, uh, providing resources, knowledge. Um, and then the other one is the more obvious one, the one that people are more familiar with, and that's enforcement. Um, enforcement enforces the applicable regulations for logging, 29 CFR 1910 to 66. So my advice to you, if you've never looked at that standard or you're not familiar with it, look it up, uh, Google it, read through it. It's not a very long standard. It's fairly short compared to other OSHA standards. It is very good, um, very easy to read, very detailed, uh, very specific. When you're doing this operation, this is what you have to do, PPE required, all that kind of stuff. So real quick, our office, uh, located in Charleston, we're more of a medium-sized OSHA office. Uh, we have currently an area director, one assistant area director, myself, a compliance system specialist, and eight compliance officers. Uh, we do have one compliance officer opening. Uh, we're waiting to hire within the next couple of months. But we have three IHs, which are industrial hygienists, and more of your health inspectors, and four safety compliance officers. Uh, one of those, or one additional safety compliance officer currently on uh, military orders. We should be back beginning of fiscal year, which is October. But as you can see, that's a large number for the enforcement side of the house. If you look at compliance assistance, it's just myself and the area director. Uh, we're the only two who do it. Outreach events like this, trainings, uh, national safety stand downs, and any alliance of partnerships or BPP program, all that kind of stuff. So, <clears throat> the nuts and bolts, nitty gritty of this whole thing, I guess, why it's important. Logging, the logging industry has been the most hazardous industry in West Virginia for some number of years, probably at least the at least the last 10 years, I would say. Um, on average, it is the highest number of fatalities for the industries we have within our jurisdictional area. You can see from October 2015 to present, just within our jurisdictional area, so within West Virginia, we had 15 fatalities specific to the logging industry. If you look at nationally, as far as federal OSHA goes, just federal OSHA, we had seven. So a good percentage when you're talking 10 different regions and each region has on average, let's say around 10 offices, 
know, that's a large number of fatalities coming from our individual office. Um, now, this information is only federal ocean. This does not include any state ocean. So if you're in Virginia, uh, Maryland, um, where else are you guys out of Carolinas, those are state plan uh, states. They have their own state ocean offices. They do have federal ocean office, but they have no jurisdiction for that type of industry. Their jurisdiction is strictly federal facilities, federal property, and anything in the maritime industry. <clears throat> So I did not include it because I don't have access to their information. But as you can see, for our office, in those inspections, we issued 140 serious violations. We averaged 4.8, so right at five serious violations for inspection, and 44 other than serious violations. Talk about this here in a minute, but sort of pay attention to those averages. You know, 4.8 and, and one, we'll talk about it when we get the penalties. But just some common logging hazards. The most common logging hazard, the one we run into on almost every logging site is PPE. Um, employees not wearing it, employers not providing certain PPE, not requiring the use. And the big thing is ensuring the use. Yeah, you can give them a hard hat, you can give them uh, you know, chaps, you can give them gloves, whatever. But if you don't make them wear it, uh, ensure that they're wearing it with some type of disciplinary action, and it's not doing any good, and you'll still get an OSHA citation for that. So just pay attention to that. The common ones here are hard hat, uh, face protection, whether it be uh, the mesh shield or safety glasses, something like that. Logging boots, sturdy logging boots, leg protection, chaps, uh, and then gloves, of course. Other common logging hazards, if you look at our fatalities, so our 15 fatalities in that time period, the vast majority of them, I would say at least 80% dealt directly with danger trees. Uh, whether those trees were not properly identified, properly removed, whatever, somehow a danger tree was directly involved in the incident. So it could have been uh, the feller was felling trees and he struck a danger tree and came back and hit the feller, or was felling trees, struck a danger tree and struck another employee, but danger trees are almost always involved and fatalities that, uh, that we get involved in. Other things you know, need to look at during your pre-cut assessment would obviously be the weather, you know, high wind days, rain, all that kind of stuff. And then our treat path. The feller needs to have their treat path plan. And the big thing is he needs to use their treat path. You might not want to use it every time, but you need to use their treat path. Just picking it out, having it available to you is not good enough. You need to use your treat path. Uh, improper felling techniques, you see this from time to time. It's not as common as it used to be. You used to run into it all the time. In the vast majority of inspections, you would see barber chairs, pulled fibers, all that kind of stuff. Nowadays, whether it's you know WVU or whoever in West Virginia doing proper training with the chainsaw and felling techniques, we don't see it as nearly as common as it used to be. But still, you need to pay attention to your felling techniques. Um, Make sure you're, you know, whatever you're using, your knowledge counts for a third the diameter of the tree, uh, and it is a proper fill. Other common logging hazards would be the wire rope. Uh, you can see guy hooking up here in the picture. And the big thing with that, some of them will tear, rip, uh, and if not properly repaired, that becomes a cut or potentially punctured wound. So you need to have proper gloves, you know, weather work gloves on. Uh, to avoid that. You also may see that these will sometimes bird nest and, and cause issues that way. At that point, you need to do a proper repair, remove it, whatever you have to do. Uh, equipment, a lot of times the equipment on site, there may be several issues that need to be fully enclosed. If it was made from the manufacturer that way, you need to have the manual, the operator's manual on site or have available access to it where you can get the compliance officer uh, a copy of the manual within a couple hours. You need to have fire extinguishers in the equipment. Um, you need to have inspections of the fire extinguisher. It's being mounted in the equipment, just not rolling around on the floor. Uh, the other thing to pay attention to on equipment and another leading cause of fatalities is unauthorized passengers. You can't ride the skitter if you're not in a seat belted seat. Majority of those are only made for one person to be inside, hence they only have one seatbelt. You cannot stack two people in there, anything like that. It's an unauthorized passenger is a big thing, and seatbelts. 
if it has a seatbelt, use the seatbelt. Um, and don't, it is part of the inspection process. You know, the compliance officer is looking at this, they will look in your, in your cab to see if the seatbelt's used or if you just have it latched behind the seat or whatever. But if it has a seatbelt, make sure you wear it. Other calming hazards that we run into here, you'll see this a lot, just random jugs, they'll fill with gasoline, oil, anything like that. You need to make sure that the can you're using, if it's gas, uh, you're using a proper safety can, um, and it does need to be a proper safety can. You just can't tote around gasoline in a plastic bottle. Uh, that's no good. Uh, other issues you'll see with your chainsaws, this is very common, the chain catch. Uh, a lot of times these will break. You need to have methods of discovering when they break, you have your feller inspect it throughout the day. And when they do break, you need to have them in place. Uh, the chain catch is an important part, an important safety feature of the chainsaw that you need. You'll have a um, preventative maintenance schedule where you replace them, have plenty of them in stock in your truck or on site somewhere where guys can get to them, access them, put new ones on if they need to. So the most common top 10 logging violations that we run into in West Virginia, the first one most common one is foot protection. An employer not ensuring that employees are wearing proper foot protection, heavy duty logging boots. Uh, and then those that are operating chainsaws have to cut resistant boots. Next one would be fire extinguishers, not having a piece of equipment or vehicle on site. Um, first aid training, basically not ensuring that each employee on site has received first aid CPR training, being the requirements of Appendix B. Every single employee on your logging site has to have that training. Every single one, that's a big, big deal. Uh, and then first aid kits. First aid kits need to be located at each work site where uh, trees being cut uh, at each active landing and on each employee transport vehicle. So make sure you have the proper number of first aid kits. You know, just, just can't have one, usually, in the majority of the time, you just can't have one and it goes for your whole site. It's not how it works. <laughs> uh, and then face protection not providing or ensuring the use of face, protect, face protection where a hazard of facial injury can occur. Next one would be head protection on having your hard hat uh, when it is required. The other, other most common one would be not maintaining audio, visual and audible contact with employees. So you can have some kind of radio contact with your feller or spelling trees and you have somebody operating a skitter, they leave visual contact and you have some kind of audible contact that they can maintain radio something like that. Cell phones are okay in situations, but especially in West Virginia, when you're at these logging sites, you may not have cell phone service. So you need to have a backup plan. If you don't have cell phone service, what are you going to use in those cases? You know, nine times out of 10, it's going to be some kind of radio. Um, next one would be just an improper cut. Undercut wasn't made. Um, basically, they were doing an improper felling technique. Next one, leg protection not not provided, not worn by employees who are using chainsaws. And then the last one would be um, minimum requirements of the first aid kit, not maintaining them. You know, employees come through, get band-aids, bandages, and all that kind of stuff, and you forget to refill it. You've got to have a system in place where you maintain those first aid kits. Then nationally, if you don't care about the Charleston area office, you can see it. 10 violations, they're basically the exact same 10 violations. There's really no difference. There's a reason they're the most common violation. Yeah. So when I give these talks to logging employers in West Virginia, the, the big thing I get is, you know, PPE, the most common violations, everything's expensive, everything costs money. Well, things to look at here. You look at our penalties and you look at what this PPE actually costs. So let's look at foot protection. Quick internet search logging foot protection anywhere from 200 bucks to 400 bucks, you know, for a decent pair of boots. If you look at the average violation for not having foot protection, basically 3,800 bucks. So if you're talking 400 bucks, 3,800 bucks, it seems pretty obvious which one is more economical to go with. Leg protection, chap, same thing. Anywhere from 60 to 100 bucks. Average violation for not having your leg protection, $1,600. Fire extinguisher, 
Uh, those range a lot in price, let's say 60, 70, 80 dollars. Uh, average penalty, a couple hundred bucks. I can't see here, block by the screen. Uh, hard hat. Hard hats are fairly inexpensive. You know, you can say 20 bucks max. Your average violation for not having a hard hat around 16, $1,700. So as you can see, in the long run of things, if OSHA inspects you, it's going to be cheaper to have the PPE maintained, required to use, and pay out the laws for your OSHA violations when that time comes up. So take you through a real quick OSHA inspection. Sort of when does OSHA conduct inspections uh, of work sites, not just logging sites, but work sites in general. Imminent danger situations, those situations that are immediately dangerous to someone's life. So that would be an employee working on a roof 30 feet in the air with no fall protection. That's an imminent danger situation. Um, worker fatalities, hospital, hospitalizations, amputations, or loss of an eye. It's pretty much a guarantee if something like that occurs, which is going to be conducting inspection of your site. Referrals, we, re we receive referrals from other federal agencies, state agencies, local new channel might call us in a situation. Those are all referrals, we do inspections on them. Targeted inspections, we have emphasis programs. So areas in high hazard industries can be put on emphasis programs and can be selected for random inspections that way. And then follow up inspection. Basically, once an inspection is conducted, you submit paperwork to us saying how you fix the violation which may do a follow-up inspection to make sure what you said you did, you actually did. The two types of inspections, unprogrammed and programmed. The unprogrammed are ones you can't plan for. In the danger situations, fatalities, catastrophes, complaints and referrals. And your program are your special emphasis program, site-specific targeting and all that stuff. If you look here, West Virginia, we have a regional emphasis program specifically for logging. So we have a, a program within our office that all of the logging jobs in the state of West Virginia um, are put on a list and randomly selected for inspection throughout the year. We conduct anywhere from 10 to 16 inspections a year. It just sort of varies from year to year uh, as far as how many we do. So the inspection process, compliance officer shows up to your site, your logging site, usually come to your landing. Uh, they'll ask for whoever's in charge, you know, whether that's the owner, foreman, lead man, whatever. Uh, the one thing they have to do at the opening conference is present their credentials. It shows who they are, that they actually work for OSHA. It's not just a business card. They have to present their credentials, and they'll explain why they're there, you know, the, the type of inspection they'll be conducting. Once they do the opening conference, they explain why they're there. They get the general company information. They will then conduct the walk-around inspection of the site. They look at the landing, all the equipment on the landing. They look at the cutting area look at, uh, evaluate the stumps and the felling procedures that are used. They will interview employees, uh, check their PPE, equipment, all that kind of stuff. Um, the compliance officer may take pictures. My advice to you, if they take pictures of something, you should take a picture of it as well, just for your own documentation. If you don't know what they're taking the picture of, ask the compliance officer, what are you taking a picture of? Why are you taking a picture of that? They'll be more than willing to tell you, explain to you all that kind of stuff. After the walk around inspection, talk to employees, talk to managers, all that kind of stuff. We will then conduct the closing conference. The closing conference is just where the compliance officer goes over what was found. Here's the violation we found. Here's what appears to be a violation to us. Here's how long we have to fix it. Here's what to expect with the inspection going forward. That's the closing conference. So, violation classification. Now, other than serious violations, serious violations, repeat, willful, failure to abate. Other than serious violations are more your programmatic violations. Um, not, no serious physical injuries gonna come from that violation. Serious violations can range anywhere from something that could result in a cut or laceration, minor first aid treatment, to anything as serious as death or permanent disability. Those are all considered serious violations. They're just different levels. Uh, you're gonna have repeat violations. If your company has been cited within the United States nationally by federal OSHA within five years, you could be cited for a repeat violation. If it's the same or similar violation, that's a repeat violation. Willful, uh, you see this in logging quite often. Uh, we issue a number of willful violations within logging uh, in our office annually. 
those are where you, the owner or manager, you know the requirements of OSHA, you know require leg protection while using the chainsaw. You know your employees don't wear leg protection because it's hot, it's middle of the summer. So you say it's okay not to wear it. You understand the hazard, you can get cut, injured, anything like that. Uh, but you still do not follow the OSHA regulation. That's a willful violation. Those are hefty penalties. And failure to abate is part of a follow-up inspection. You submitted your paperwork, you said you fixed it, we come back to check on it. Turns out you actually did not fix it. That's failure to abate. All right, so we're talking about penalty structure. The current maximum serious violation for OSHA is $13,653. I said we averaged 4.8 serious violations per inspection, so let's say four. $13,653 per serious violation. That one inspection on average, you're looking at $54,000 in penalties. That's a hefty penalty for the four most common violations being PPE. So three, $400 PPE, $54,000 in penalties. I mean, like, same way from what I would choose. Uh, failure to abate and willful, you can see the maximum penalties here. Uh, but these are maximum penalties. We do have penalty adjustment factors. Uh, your history with OSHA, and you've only had any compliance or other serious violations, you get a reduction. If you haven't been inspected by OSHA within five years, you get no reduction because you have no history. Size reduction, if you're a small employer, less than 10 employees, you get like a 70% size reduction right off the bat. Uh, good faith, if you have a safety and health program, safety and health management system, your employees are involved in it, you can get good faith reductions that way. Um, the one thing I do want to point out, if it is a fatality inspection, and violations are found involving fatality, so directly that directly related to the fatality. So let's say a danger tree fell, struck your feller, and died. Uh, we have a violation with the danger tree. You get no penalty reductions for that violation. So you get maximum serious violation penalty for anything involved directly with the fatality. So it's a quick resources for you available to you out there. Each state has OSHA consultation, OSHA on-site consultation program. In West Virginia, they're a state agency. Uh, it's West Virginia Division of Labor. Google it, come up. It's free of charge. Um, they're consultants that come out on your site. It has no affiliation with us, enforcement, you know, federal OSHA whatsoever. There's no overlap unless they point something out to you and you never fix it. Then they can forward it to enforcement, but that rarely to never occurs. It is a very good program. The big thing is it's free. You sign up for it, it's free. They'll come out to your site, help you with programs, help you with training, help you with safety walkthroughs, anything you want they can do for you. Being in a high hazard industry, you get precedence over other employers and you know, a more of general industry or construction. These are the current region three OSHA consultation projects, uh, DC, Delaware, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and West Virginia. You can see the contact information on here. Again, if you have questions about them, just Google them. Programs will come up. Get your contact to them that way. Uh, E-tools. If you're not familiar with OSHA E-tools, if you Google OSHA logging E-tool, this will come up. It sort of takes you through the process, manual operations, mechanical operations, all the hazards associated with it, different resources available to you, how to mitigate the hazards, PPE requirements, all that kind of stuff. It is very good. Our compliance officers, when we have new compliance officers in the office, we send them to the e-tool and say, hey, go through the e-tool, get familiar with it. It should help you out, you know, make you more familiar with the industry, potential hazards out there for you. Uh, I couldn't recommend it enough. It is, it is very good and very beneficial for you. As far as my presentation goes, that was everything I had. Um, if you have any questions, now it's time to ask. This is my contact information on here. If you want to, you don't want to ask on this, which is fine. Um, if you want to shoot me an email, go ahead. Or you can call the officer, call me directly, uh, and I can answer it for you that way as well. So, Anthony, we had a couple of questions in the chat box here. Um, one of them was um, the first aid training. Is uh, is that just the? Uh, can you go over what the required first aid training and CPR training is um, and 
and that does yeah that does include the wilderness first. So, so as far as OSHA goes, yeah. So as far as OSHA goes, and it's specifically for the logging standard. The training is only specific. So it doesn't have to be Red Cross. It doesn't have to be anything like that. You, the employer, if you're trained in first aid, CPR, all that kind of stuff, you can do the training yourself for your employees. You just have to certify that the training was done, and you have to make sure that that training was done in accordance with Appendix B. You followed everything in that appendix. Okay. And so that's the, the first aid and CPR. And in, are you required to have uh, additional work in the bloodborne pathogens as well? Um, yeah, you would be required to have some bloodborne pathogen training. If you have, you know, people on site are designated as potential first aid responders. They need to be trained in bloodborne pathogens, sort of what your company's program covers, uh, you know, that they're covered under. Uh, potential hepatitis exposures, all that kind of stuff. They'll get post exposure reviews uh, and everything like that. Agnes was asking, uh, how do you get trained in bloodborne pathogens? Um, so the employer can do that training. It's nothing, you know, nothing real specific. The standard spells out the training that's required, uh, sort of what is anticipated of them. What they need to do this, again, this isn't something major that you have to call in, you know, a, a third party consultant or anything like that. You, the employer, can do the bubble and packaging training yourself. But those are also part of the Red Cross and then some of the commercial products. Yes. Uh, they do have those bloodborne pathogen and as part of the overall package and, and first aid CPR. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's the way to, if, if you want to do it, my recommendation would be to go that way, but there is. The OSHA requirement, you don't have to do it. Anthony, mm -hmm. can you tell us, a, can you give us a little background on the type of uh, professionals that you have that are working on these inspections? How, how are they trained and how are they, um, I guess, how, what is their experience with the logging site? How do we know that when they come out to the logging site that they understand the situations that, that the loggers yeah. are facing? So every compliance officer who comes out to a logging site will have general, have been through several logging inspections. So if we have a new trainee, they've never been through a logging inspection, they will start tagging along with other compliance officers when they go to do a logging inspection. So nobody is just thrown in and say, hey, here, go do a logging inspection. Uh, you are trained usually by the senior compliance officer in the office or whoever is deemed to be the the logging guru, we'll call them the logging guru within the office. We have people, compliance officers who like to do logging inspections and they'd rather do 20 logging inspections as opposed to construction. Hey, more power to them. That's what they want to do. And that's what they're knowledgeable in and enjoy doing and they should go do it. Um, so usually those are the people you'll get. Um, if it is a fatality, uh, it's you may get any compliance officer, but again, all of our compliance officers have been to logging sites, have done logging inspections. So nobody is brand new that they've never been to a logging. They would never come to a logging inspection if they've never been to a logging. So everyone has received some general on the job training. Anthony, this is Brad Perkins with the Hot Forestry Association. So looking at uh, safety footwear for chainsaw operators. Um, I've, had, I've had a lot of questions about this in the past and done a lot of research on it. And you know, OSHA has a statement there that basically says, you know, if the employer, employee uses a chainsaw, the foot mirror must be constructed with cut resistant material that will protect against contact with a running chainsaw. But it doesn't, it's not very specific and there's no like ANSI, you know, specs with that like you would for safety glasses or something like that. You, do you see where they're ever going to develop a, you know, an ANSI regulation for that that meets a certain requirement for instance is it got to be kevlar it's got to be nylon it's got to have steel um there just isn't uh, yeah i haven't heard of anything doesn't mean they're not but the, the standard's been in play for so long it doesn't i doubt that they're coming out with anything yeah um the main thing we would go by is what the manufacturer of the boots does the manufacturer claim that it's cut resistant 
If they do, then that's what we'll go with. Okay. Thanks. Can you explain how that would happen on on the site? So you're looking at each of the, the timber fellers uh, footwear, and uh, you you note the the make and model of that boot, and then investigate that off site. Or, or if the logger says no, it's cut resistant, uh, you uh, you take their word for it and, and move on forward with. No, uh, we'll check. We'll ask: Are these cut resistant? They may know them. May not know, but we'll write general information down. Give them, you know, look under the tongue, get the model information, all that. Google it, you know, go back to the office, Google, see what we get. And uh, usually, the majority of the time, that's how it works out. You can yeah. find it that way. Well, since I don't see other questions, I got some more for you. <laughs> You're okay answering those. Uh, I guess what, uh, so uh, if you're as the ocean inspector, you're arriving on a, a site, and uh, I guess can you tell us some of the things that you've seen loggers do in their uh, reaction to your arrival um, that uh, that uh, makes you uh, maybe more critical um, or or sends up red flags that uh, oh something's going wrong yeah. here, and, and how that compares um, to that welcomes you onto their site and. Uh, yeah, so the majority of the time we'll show up at the landing and we'll wait for somebody to come to the landing. You know, eventually somebody has to come to the landing, bring a log, load of logs or something like that. When they get there, we'll say who we are. We need to speak to everybody, have everybody come out here and meet us at the landing. And so right away, it's a test. Do you have communication with your fellows back there in the cutting, the cutting area? Usually the majority of the time they do. But from time to time, they'll say, all right, let me go back there and get them. And so we'll ask, well, don't you have communication? Don't you have a way to, to tell them, come out here? That's one violation already. Uh, the other one is you'll see guys just come walking out of the woods in their T-shirt and can't. You know, where's your chaps? Where's your hard hat? Where's your PP? Oh, I left it back at the cutting end. Well, okay, we're going to go back there to check it out. About halfway back, they'll say, well, actually, I didn't have any of my PPE on today. Uh, that happens more often than not. Uh, majority of the time, guys are more nervous uh, um, to talk to us. They're, you know, they're afraid you're going to say something wrong, I'm sure, um, or whatever. But you get more nervous reactions than anything. There are. Uh, from time to time, you get the confrontational employer who wants to go go at it, you know, have his voice heard that he's anti-government, doesn't believe OSHA stands for anything or anything like that, you know, so you let him voice it out, get everything out of the way, and we're here to do a job, that's all we're trying to do. Um, but that's usually the reaction we get. Usually people are more nervous than me. We try to put them at ease, talking to them and all that kind of stuff, but. I, I get it. I understand. Nobody wants to get a, a penalty violation. But if you're doing what you should be doing, then they nothing to worry about. Are there other questions from some of our other uh, panelists or from our uh, audience participants? Yes, thank you for asking. It saves me from typing. <laughs> I was just starting to type the question. Anthony, my question is, do you kind of have like a checklist? I know the Virginia Sharp Logger Program has a checklist for kind of what to do to remain compliant with OSHA. Does OSHA have some sort of checklist that loggers could use, excuse me, that loggers could use um, to kind of make sure that they're getting everything done? So we have a checklist within our office. It is not shareable because it was internally created. However, since we created it, I can tell you how we created it. If you go through the logging standard 266, each section is broke down. It will say uh, PPE. And then underneath that, uh, our chaps, you know, will have on the checklist, PPE, chaps, provided, used, yes or no. Um, and we'll just go through the standard like that. That's how we created our checklist. Um, so that's the only, only recommendation I have. As far as available for 
the masses to download on our website? No, we do not have that. But I mean, our office, our guys, we came up with, with it within an afternoon. It took a couple hours, nothing too long. So, you know, the average person can go through it and, and have one probably made up in a day, no issue. And I would guess that some of the state consultation services have a list that they use as well that yep. may be more shareable um, as well. So you could contact that. Yeah, consultation more than likely would be able to share anything there. OSHA also has a, a, a fact sheet on working safely with chainsaws. It's just called that. I think yeah. that's a great guide. I mean, it lists everything from the work area safety to the operating the chainsaw to before starting the saw. I mean, it, it's a pretty detailed list already. I just put in the website the link to the OSHA logging stand, not in the website, in the chat. I put the link to the OSHA logging standard if people are curious. Thank you, Anthony. Yeah, no Anthony, how long does a typical OSHA inspection take for, well, I guess of the, I guess when, when, when you go out and do an inspection, say there was 20 done in West Virginia um, in the last year or so, how many of those have violations? And uh, um, the quick ones versus the really long and involved ones, how, what's the time frame that you might see uh, the inspector on the site? Okay, uh, our logging inspections, 99% of them have violations. Um, An in-compliance logging inspection is not very common, uh, especially in West Virginia for whatever reason. Uh, it's not impossible, but it is uncommon to run into. But as far as how long an inspection takes, it varies from inspection to inspection. I've done logging inspections where it took an hour, maybe two hours to do the inspection. Um, if we're talking more complex case fatality or hospitalization, those can take a couple of days to a couple of weeks. Um, it just sort of varies. We have to interview everybody who was on site, especially if it was a fatality. We need to talk to everybody, so that takes time. If there's a hospitalization, we have to talk to the injured employee, so that takes time. Basically, OSHA has six months. From the time we see a, a hazard, we have six months to issue any citations related to that. So anywhere in there, it could be anywhere from, you know, you can get your citations in a couple of days to six months later. Anybody else? We had a hand that was raised by our attendees. If they uh, still have a question, they can raise their hand and we can uh, allow them to ask questions now. I, I did, while we're waiting for that person to, to raise their hand, I did put the Virginia logger safety checklist. If you haven't checked it out, I put the link in the um, chat box. If you haven't checked it out, it's worth a good look to kind of keep you keep you motivated to um, make sure you're not spending a whole bunch of cash on anything that may have gone wrong. <laughs> and I also put the link to that OSHA fact sheet out there on chainsaw safety. Yeah, thanks, Agnes. Our um, logger safety checklist booklet has, um, you know, what to expect from an OSHA visit. It has um, some sample um, training meeting agendas and materials uh, to do your um, monthly safety trainings. And um, that is uh, downloadable there on that website that Agnes put in. Anthony, do you find that um, people do their, their monthly trainings? Maybe? Yeah. No, that's uh, another almost given violation. You know, one, one thing we sometimes say is if there's no record of it, it didn't happen. So um, it's a good idea when, if you have those training monthly safety talks. It doesn't have to be real long, but make sure you, um, you know, write down something that you did it. Definitely, yep. Definitely write it down because we'll ask you, the employer, we'll ask the employees, 
if you have three employees and we ask them, did you do a safety talk? And they say no. And we ask you, did you do a safety talk? And you say yes. We've got to sort of get to the bottom of it. Uh, you know, which maybe they don't remember, maybe something's going on. If you do one, write it down. Make sure you, you note it and have people sign it and get a paper trail. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit on, on the difference uh, between inspections for, say, logging versus a uh, um, uh, fast food restaurant or construction? Uh, are some of those industries more targeted because of the din here in danger? Or, um, yeah, I guess, how, how, how are those um, prioritized in the overall OSHA inspection program? So, any any inspection gets precedence if it's fatality, catastrophe, injury, hospitalization. So regardless of industry, if it's logging, if it's construction, if it's if it's an office shop, if somebody, you know, if it is a uh, telemarketer and one of them dies from carbon monoxide exposure, that's got the same precedence as a tree falling on a log. Uh, so we'll you know we'll respond to it just as quickly as we would to a logging incident. Um, as far as, you know, program inspections, NPs, that kind of stuff, we have those specifically for high hazard industries. So you'll see it in logging. We have NEPs, NCIS program for construction. We have it in our expanded health standards. So any industry where you have potential lead exposures, anything like that, those are higher up to receive, you know, their own emphasis programs. Um, other than that, though, there's really not much of a difference. The only, the only thing I will say is, as I already mentioned, the logging standard is really cut and dry, really straightforward. Whereas you go into, let's say, a fast food restaurant, there's a whole list of different hazards you're looking at, and they're not as, as clear and obvious. You know, one of, one of our most common hazards in fast food, you might not realize this, is carbon monoxide. Uh, we get a lot of carbon monoxide exposures in fast food restaurants. So they take natural gas and they burn it as fuel for their deep fryers, char broilers, grills, all that kind of stuff. And if they don't have proper ventilation, the byproduct of that is carbon monoxide. And so you'll see that their ventilation sy systems get gummed up with grease and everything like that. And, you know, usually in the winter, they'll have carbon monoxide exposure. The, I guess the other thing that I, I guess I'd be real interested in hearing is, uh, are there some things that, that you see in logging inspections that our loggers are doing an excellent job at in safety? Um, I, I think so much of the OSHA kind of story is, you didn't do this and, and you're in trouble. Um, yeah. Are there stories out there that you can share that, that help sort of uh, explain some of the diligence and, and uh, effort that our loggers are using um, to be safe. Yeah. Um, the area I will say, I will say, it does seem when most employers become aware of the requirements, they do a better job uh, for loggers. Well, I do find once they are made aware of it, the majority of them do follow those requirements. Uh, and this doesn't affect you know, you guys much, but I do consider it as a specific to the logging industry. Loggers are pretty truthful. Um, and being with OSHA, we get lied to the vast majority of the times. And, and you learn to see through it, you know, in construction and all that kind of stuff. But 100% honestly, loggers are, are more straight shooters. They'll straight up tell you, yeah, I know it's required, we just don't do it. You know, they'll, they'll be 100% honest with you. That's one of the main things I like. Are there any other questions that we have today? Well, I think uh, we've had a, a very good discussion of, of a lot of the topics uh, involved with OSHA uh, compliance. 
uh, and OSHA inspections, uh, and a little better understanding of, of the whole process that OSHA goes through uh, as they visit a logging site. So, Anthony, thank you very much for, for being with us today um, and answering questions and, and giving us your presentation. I think it's been excellent. Um, Thanks, Brad. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, with that, um, our, our, I guess our formal uh, part of the program is, uh, uh, is complete. I will say that uh, these are being recorded and uh, we will have these available on the West Virginia University Extension's e-learning site. Um, and so anybody from Ohio, Virginia, uh, Maryland, Delaware, or West Virginia are able to visit those recordings answer a few questions in the middle of the recordings. Um, and at the end, you will be issued a certificate and that certificate will go straight to your uh, logger certification program uh, as well as a copy to yourself. So uh, um, we'll share that uh, link to, with everybody here um, uh, with your certificates for completing this session as well. So um, if you're interested in that uh, or have any problems with it, please contact me. Um, or uh, any of the other people on this uh, uh, organizing the webinar here. Um, we'd be happy to get you in contact with the right person to answer all your questions there. So uh, with that, I think we are all done. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, we hope to see you next month when we learn about silvicul or with deer and silviculture.